How you doing everyone? Greetings and welcome to this episode of 8 Bits in the Basement where I am quite happy because I finally managed to iron out all the little problems I was having with my Atari 7800 here. So you may remember that around Christmas time I did an episode where I showed this unit that I had gotten myself and that it was supposed to be working okay apart from it had a problem with the cartridge port and it didn't have any cables so there was no way to get power into it or to get an image on screen but what we did was we made up a power cable we made up a video cable we got the whole thing working and we also tested out the cartridge port with a 2600 cartridge and everything seemed to be working fine well, everything seemed to be working fine apart from the fact that the select and the reset button were both working as reset buttons which wasn't really right so what I noticed from playing around with the system a bit was after it had been left powered on for about five or ten minutes the select button magically started working again and all it took to get it to not work anymore was to power off the system for about 30 seconds so what that said to me was maybe the capacitors were starting to fail inside in the system and maybe that was the reason why because we've all heard stories of capacitors causing sound issues and causing video issues and in the worst cases really exploding all across the board well leaking all across the board and eating tracks and all that kind of stuff and damaging the system beyond repair but it seems that in my case here at least what was happening was they were failing in such a way that they were taking longer time five or ten minutes to build up their charge and uh, once they had the charge built up they were working properly but uh, when the system was powered down and they had lost their charge then they couldn't build it up anymore so I decided the best thing to do was change the capacitors and see if that was what the problem was so I whipped the Atari open again and I had a look at the board now there wasn't any sign of leakage and the capacitors looked to be absolutely fine so I decided what I'd do anyways just just to make sure was to change out the three capacitors that were found on the motherboard so that's what I did using my solder socket I managed to get the capacitors off easily enough but one big big problem I had was that I found it very very hard to clear the ground holes for the capacitors that I had removed and the reason for that is that the Atari 7800 has a massive massive ground plane on it and it seems well, it seems that it sucks away any of the heat that you apply to it so in the end I had to use a soldering iron and a solder sucker to manage to remove that solder to be able to put in the new capacitors but once I got over that little hurdle everything worked away fine so if you are going modifying or changing chips or doing anything on an Atari 7800 be aware that it has a massive ground plane and you're going to have to turn up the heat on your soldering iron or solder sucker or whatever a little bit hotter in order to be able to remove some of those components now while I was at it I decided what I'd do was change out the heat paste on the 7805 voltage regulator because it's been about 30 years so the voltage regulator holds that massive well it's not massive but it's big enough heat sink that you see on the top of the motherboard in place so there's little nut and bolt going through both of them so I undid that and I removed the heat sink with no trouble whatsoever then I removed the old heat paste that was on both the 7805 and the heat sink using a little piece of cloth and I applied a kind of pea-sized blob of new solder paste to the back of the 7805 and just kind of rubbed it around a bit to kind of spread it out put the whole lot back together again with that nut and bolt in place and then off camera because I didn't think to turn on the camera I tried it out and it was working right the select and reset buttons were working properly I didn't have to wait five to ten minutes they worked off the bat the way they should and I could leave the unit powered off for a while and power it back on and away it worked just fine and while I had the system open I figured I'd spurt a little bit of of contact cleaner into the buttons the switches and also the cartridge slot put the whole lot back together and I was satisfied that all that was working exactly the way it should so I was using away on it for a couple of days with my 2600 games and I was delighted then in the post I got this here a copy of Jinx now I'll be honest with you it is a game for the Atari 7800 and the only reason I bought it was that it's the cheapest cheapest game I could find and my intention for it is to open it up remove the ROM chip that's in it and make it in such a way that I can swap out different ROM chips so that I can try different games on the Atari 7800 now what I did when I got it 
was I plugged it in to see if it would work right, work away grand. And it does, it seems to be working fine. But when I press the button, the game doesn't start. Now, as far as I know, pressing a button on an Atari game usually starts it, but the reset button does here in this case. Now, Jinx is a game that has a reputation of not being fantastic because it's kind of a boring game. It's very hard to get killed in it and you're not really doing a whole lot. And when I was playing it, I said, yeah, well, I agree with that. I can move this paddle thing up, down, left and right, but the fire button doesn't actually do anything at all. So I figured the game is even worse than what I was expecting it to be. So in the end, I went and had a look at the Jinx manual. And it spoke of fire button A and B doing two completely different things, but this thing doesn't have a fire button A and B. And digging around a little further, I found that actually the Atari 7800 was sold with a controller that had two fire buttons. And not only that, but they're wired up in a completely different manner than the fire button on the Atari 2600 controller is. So this, with an awful lot of games, won't actually do anything or just won't cut the butter as, as such. So I had another little look around on the internet and I found, I found that you could modify Nintendo controllers to work with the 7800. And then I remembered something. So this guy here that I have in front of me is a NES. It doesn't look like one because it's out of the shell and it was recuperated from a dustbin. My, uh, my brother-in-law gave it to me and I tried to cobble it back together and now it works great, although it looks kind of Frankenstein-y. But the reason I'm showing it to you is this. Any games that I have for this system are one player. I've got two controllers hooked onto it, but really I, I only need one. I've never used the second one. And these guys here are Chinese reproduction, real cheap controllers, but there is a way to convert them over so that they work on the Atari 7800. And <clears throat> on the internet, not too long ago, I came across this here, which is a simple way to convert it. So all we do is we open up this device. On the inside, this is what the PCB looks like. There's a blob chip on it, and then there's all these represent, well, they don't represent the little touch pads for the buttons. So what we're going to do is we're going to be bypassing this chip altogether. We're going to be just scraping back the solder mask on some of the tracks here to expose the copper. And we are going to solder wires directly and then bring them out to a DB9 connector that we can plug into the Atari 7800. Okay, so the project had just become a little more fun. Now what I was going to do was convert a Nintendo controller into a controller that would work with my 7800. So turning around the back of the little controller, I saw that the plastic case itself was held together with four screws. So I removed those and opened it up. Now, on the inside, the PCB is held to the front plastics with just one screw. I removed that guy and turned around the PCB itself. And there I was pleasantly surprised because I found that there was a lot of solder mask scraping that I wouldn't actually have to do. It seemed that many of the pads on that PCB had solder points actually on the board. So it's like this board was made in such a way that this kind of thing was to be done with it. So I was delighted with that. So what I did was I started prepping the board. I removed the five wires joining the board to the Nintendo uh, cable and connector. And then I cleared out those five holes using my little hand solder pump and my soldering iron. And once I had finished with that, I put a little bit of solder and flux onto those pads that I'd be joining wires onto later on. And there is actually one little modification that needs to be done on this board, even with all those pads in place. And the fact that the Atari has a ground point for the directions and then is connected a little bit different for the fire buttons means that you need to cut one trace on the PCB itself. So first of all, what you want to do is expose two points on that trace that you can solder to. So I did one on the left hand side of the board and one on the right hand side of the board. And once I had a little bit of solder on each of those exposed traces, I checked to see that there was continuity. And then I cut the trace with my little exacto or Stanley knife. And I checked again to make sure that there was no continuity. So I was happy enough. Now my board had been prepared. 
and it was ready to have wire soldered onto it. Now, I want to use up any of the bits and pieces I have lying around in the basement down here. And what I have knocking around for the past 13 years is a piece of telephone cable that I have never used for anything. So I decided to use it for this particular project just to use it up. Now, this guy needs eight wires to go from the controller to the Atari 7800. And this particular telephone cable has four cores of wire within it. So what I did was I took that length of cable and I cut it in two. And then I used the two strands of cable to give me the eight cores I needed. Now, um, what I did was I just paired them back and I wired those eight wires to where they needed to go on the PCB. Now, the more eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that on that little set of plans that I showed you, there were two resistors, two 620 ohm resistors that are used for the buttons on the Atari 7800. Now, they're usually wired in to the cable in a way that isn't very neat, makes it a little bit kind of ugly looking and also isn't the strongest. So I decided what I do was wear it directly to the PCB. So what I did was I twisted one end of each of the um, resistors together and put a little bit of solder on them. And then what I did was I joined the other end of each of the resistors to where they should go on the PCB itself. Then I ran a little piece of wire from the opposite end of the resistors joined together out to the point on the PCB where, where they should go as well, I suppose. And uh, that was pretty much the mod completed. All that remained to be done was to wire a DB9 connector to the end so that I could plug it into the Atari itself and to finish up, close everything back up together and see if it worked. Now, the first time I tried this, it worked great apart from left went right and right went left because I had wired it up backwards. So I had to go back to DB9 connector and change that wiring and then everything worked well. So I'll show you, I'll show you what it does right now. So this here is what I've made. I have converted a Nintendo controller into a controller that should work on Atari 7800. And as you can see, it's got a dual telephone coming out of it. Well, dual telephone line coming out of it. And it's got knots right away through so that I can't strangle myself with it. And also what I've done is I've put a little bit of hot glue on the end of it to kind of secure this connector on the top and to protect all of the little solder points that I made. And it's fairly rigid. So what we'll do is we'll plug it in and I'll show you what it does. Now I'm powering on here. We get asteroids on screen, which is normal because we don't have a cartridge in here. Now you'll remember, maybe if you saw the previous episode, that with an Atari 2600 joystick, I could play asteroids no problem. The fire button fired and I could move forward and left and right as I should. But if I wanted to teleport, I just pushed down on the joystick. That was the way it worked. Now, this joystick changes things around a little bit. When I press B, it starts the game for me. I can turn left and right as before. I can move up to fire or move up to move forward. B is my fire button. But if I want to teleport, the down direction doesn't actually do anything. I need to press the A button and that'll make me teleport around the screen. So um, you can see that it is actually working as a dual button controller, but the A button isn't functioning as down as such, if that makes sense. Anyway, what I will do is I'll throw in the Jinx game and you can see how that works. So you remember that this Jinx game, when I put it in before, the button on the Atari 2600 joystick wouldn't actually launch the game. I had to press reset. However, if I press the B button on this now, it gets the game going. And the other thing was that fire with the Atari 2600 joystick didn't do anything at all. I could only move up and down and left and right. However, with this particular joystick, I can move left and right and I can go up and down as well. But the B button here will invert my paddle. If you can see that I go from a kind of an inverted pyramid here to a regular pyramid so I can control around the, the ball a lot better. And also the A button makes the screen shake, which is what you're supposed to do if the ball gets stuck. Now, this joystick used with an Atari 2600 game will also work away fine. The thing is that 
both of these buttons will do exactly the same thing in an Atari 2600 game. So that works away. Uh, that works away absolutely brilliantly as well that way. So all in all, I'm kind of happy with this whole system. I'm happy the way it turned out and it appears to be working away pretty much perfectly. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this episode. Uh, what can I say? I mean, I, I seem to have this time I said before I had a fully functioning Atari apart from one problem. Now it seems to be working away perfectly without any problems whatsoever, having replaced the capacitors and made up a joystick for it. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did and you're not subscribed, think of subscribing. Otherwise, give us now a thumbs up if you would. If you didn't like the video, give us a thumbs down. It is just as good to know that a video hasn't been liked as it is to know that it has been liked. But if you didn't like it and you're still watching, then I'd ask why. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other videos out there you, you would enjoy more rather than watching me up to the end. But uh, other than that, a comment is always well appreciated and uh, I'll, I'll try and answer any comments I get. And oh yeah, <clears throat> I was just wondering if you ever heard, if you ever heard, if you're into Star Trek, of course, how many ears does Captain Jean-Luc Picard have? Two, you say? No, he has three. He has his left ear, his right ear and space, the final frontier. So there you go. Anyway, I'll leave you on that. We'll talk to you all next time. Have fun. Bye-bye.